Oh, thank you. Spirit DAO is how you pronounce it? And it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And I'll, I, we're going to, that'll be part of, so this is, um, as you guys may or may not be aware, this is intended to be kind of a four-part discussion series over you know, four different kind of aspects. It's about the, um, I, I don't know if all of you received my texts or emails. No, I was, I did. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. So if you haven't already, this is based off, um, this, this kind of discussion is based off the book Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis, published it about 15 months ago. Um, since its publication, I've actually given the book away to a nonprofit community that's formed around it. Um, but you can download it for free. So if you don't, if you don't want a physical book if you prefer ebooks or audiobooks, if you just take a picture uh, with your phone of that barcode in your book, uh, it will bring you to the website where you can download any digital format you want. Um, if you want a physical copy, you, you can grab on Amazon or, or get one there. So um, with that note, just going to bring up my notes. We'll kind of dive in. <coughs> Would you do me a favor and tell me what your background is, your sure. educational background? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I have I have uh, two degrees, um, one from Hofstra University. Uh, well, two from Hofstra I, University. I can't hear very well when you turn your back. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> I have two bachelor's degrees from Hofstra University in New York. I have a marketing management degree. I have uh, advanced coursework in economics from the Henry George School of Social Science, which is like an NYU spinoff. Um, and in my past efforts, prior to kind of finding myself here, I, in my early 20s, I was a founder of a Web2 company. I was a CEO for eight years and ended up getting acquired. I then served as an executive director for a 501c3 nonprofit in New Jersey. It was a civic technology nonprofit. We built uh, software for <coughs> local municipal election contests uh, to kind of you know, engage deeper participation. Um, learned some great lessons, uh, some hard lessons. Uh, I've been a a local organizer, I've run for state senate before, and um, a lot of kind of what brought me to this moment here with you guys and and kind of brought me to this journey, this path is, I realized through my personal efforts that the available vehicles for change resisted by design, political, economic, legal. So the book and kind of our larger discussion that we'll be having is about imagining an alternative. How do we construct an alternative to kind of transcend the various crises that kind of surround us um, when everything available to do that in the legal format seeks to preserve the status quo? And in many ways, so this, our conversation is going to be uh, four parts. Today, we're gonna focus on the actual uh, analysis of the crisis, the meta crisis. The meta crisis is made up of many things. I'm going to bring up my notes real quick, then we'll, we'll kind of dive in. But you may have also heard it referred to as the poly crisis. I labeled the age of crisis um, in the book. And what it kind of refers to is essentially our, our legal, our economic, our political, our spiritual institutions fail to meet the needs of the moment. We're surrounded by all of these crises that you know, any one of which would be bad enough. Uh, but collectively, they form <coughs> seemingly an insurmountable obstacle. How do we kind of get past um, these challenges that we face <coughs> on the horizon within institutions that in many ways are directly responsible for kind of proliferating them? One moment. <coughs> So we'll get started. So just as a quick kind of summary, let me get this. Self-actualization in the age of crisis, the book, if you haven't had an opportunity to just look, look it over yet, is a book that develops new frameworks of meaning and value informed by cosmology and physics. It, the central thesis of the book is we must bind spiritual renaissance to systemic reformation. Now, I also want to emphasize, this is a small group, I'd love to keep it as dialectic as possible. So if I say language you're not familiar with, or you want me to kind of pull on a thread deeply, just interrupt, you know, we can can just kind of take this as it goes. Um, At the same time, fair warning, I do get excited about this stuff. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get into it as we we talk. Um, 
the book in many ways is a framework for a non-religion religion. It's an attempt to kind of orient ourselves with the nature of reality as it is, as what our hard sciences now tell us, <coughs> as opposed to what our inherited dogmas prefer it to be. And I argue that this kind of spiritual renaissance is kind of central to overcoming the values crises. So in this discussion, we are going to primarily focus on analyzing the age of crisis. So this is a, a big, you know, about the problems, and then the next three discussions will be about the solutions, the alternatives. Um, and today we're gonna kind of examine this, the crises, from six distinct perspectives. Uh, this is how I kind of go through them. We're gonna talk about the crisis of extinction. We're gonna talk about the crisis of billionaire god kings in the 21st century, the crisis of information, truth, and trust, elected misrepresentation, productivity and participation, and finally, doubt, desire, death, and dogmas. Uh, at the end of this course, it's my hope that you will be <coughs> extremely, you'll have a, an alternative perspective of the possibilities that are kind of available to us, given our kind of technological ascendancy, especially in the last decade, uh, which we'll kind of deep get into. Outside of all the my past um, experience I've shared with you, I'm also technically a software engineer. Uh, I've built software products, uh, I'm at the forefront of AI and, and many of these things. So uh, I think it's a, a really, we, we're gonna have a really fascinating discussion and I'm excited to kind of share it with you. So let's dive in. We're gonna just talk, just talk about and, and begin with the, the crisis of extinction. The crisis of extinction is probably the one you've heard the most about, or at least in some circles, right? Depending on where you get your information sources from. But it's essentially a domino effect of ecosystem collapse that is devastating plant and animal life. And the larger existential threat to humanity is it's fundamentally reshaping where we can grow food, how we access water, and things like that. So it's, it's less, when I say extinction, it's not about the extinction of the planet, it's more about the extinction of our way of life uh, and, and humanity as, as we know it. So we can just kind of go over some of the, the facts of just like the, the present, the immediate present, where do we stand? So, Data shows us today that our oceans and lakes are evaporating. And what that does is it heats up the atmosphere and causes further evaporation. So you have these feedback loops. We know that uh, our, our glaciers are melting. Right? We've probably seen this. What that does is it adds increasing salinity to the water, which devastates. I'm sorry, I, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to have to go. Have to I'm sorry, you're not feeling well. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. So what the additional salinity does is devastates marine and, and animal life. We have lost uh, more forests in the last 100 years than we did in the past 9,000 years combined. Our deserts are expanding. And uh, so all of this kind of positions, it, it completely kind of reshapes the trends of where food is going to be able to grow. Not only that, this is a fun fact. Since 1960, natural disasters are occurring at a rate of 10 times more frequent today than they did over the last 60 years. So an order of magnitude increase. So I think when we think about the crisis of extinction and the ecological changes that have happened, it's not just food and water, but it's also the kind of mass devastation events. And I think, you speaking as someone who lives in Florida, this is something that's on the top of my mind. What happens when we have a hurricane category six? Right, it's something we've never seen before, and the infrastructure damage that kind of creates. So the crisis of extinction is, is kind of this kind of cascading effect. Another key note about the crisis of extinction is it disproportionately impacts the poor, indigenous communities, and youth, those young and not yet born. Right, They're going to inherit these circumstances, these crises, that they had no say in crafting. Uh, that are going to permanently alter their way of life. We're also in the middle of the sixth major extinction. The, the, so 70% of surveyed animal life is expected to go extinct. The last major extinction was the Cretaceous period, the distinction, extinction of the dinosaurs. So to kind of give you a scope of the, the scale of death and animal die-off that is occurring in our immediate present right now. now the, at the center of the crisis of extinction, kind of when we think about the, the impacts this is going to have, it disproportionately places the burden on people based on birth lottery. That is to say, if you were born, let's say, in abject poverty, if you were born in a, a, a country that is not as industrialized as the US, 
you are going to bear the brunt of these crises, uh, again, despite having no, no, no active participation within them. An important aspect to understand about the crisis of extinction is that the systems that we surround ourselves, and I'm gonna use the word system a lot, let me define that for a moment. A system is any technology, it could be economic, legal, political, social, religious, that governs the relationships between two or more people. So it's a very blanket term, right? So I say systems, it's, it's many of the creations we've kind of surrounded ourselves with. I think at the core, the central challenge with this is they continue to perpetuate it. The knowledge is there. No one is unaware, especially kind of like national and global leadership of the severity of the crisis. But as an example, um, the US is now producing, in 2024, the US is producing more oil than we ever have in our history. Under Biden's administration, we've already issued over 6,000 new oil drilling permits, many on nationally protected lands. So despite this information, global leadership continues to do the very thing that is driving us towards a crisis, right? I think all of us understand one of the first ways to get out of a hole is to stop digging. Uh, but collectively, we have not stopped digging. <coughs> we keep moving forward uh, with the very actions that are kind of bringing them. Not to mention, we've been, in the, in the global state has been essentially a global state of war now going on about 23 years. Right? It's been perpetual, it continues to go on. War is a for-profit business, and I think many of the challenges, and we're gonna talk about the systems that we've inherited, but much of the struggle is that we limit our possible solutions to a very dogmatic approach about markets. Right? We say that we have to solve this, but we, we can only solve it through markets, but not all markets, only a single market order. And that's central to kind of the, the US being a global leader in this kind of movement here. So all of this kind of gives us the context of the large scale crisis of extinction that is continuing to worsen, continuing to compound, and most importantly, global leadership is not choosing not to take the appropriate action to change it. So let's move on to the crisis of the billionaire god. Now this can be a kind of sensitive one. So I wanna talk about first what this is not about, what the crisis of the billionaire God King is not about. Being anti-billionaire is not being anti-luxury. It's not being anti-private enterprise or private markets. It's none of those things. It roots itself in the belief that humanity will never be free in a society of class and caste. It is a rejection of the idea that we have these small networks of essentially unelected kings who can control nearly all of the vital social verticals in private enterprise. They dictate global politics, propaganda, property, and the laws defining those things in order to maintain personal power networks. Class societies Prioritize birth lottery is the most important event in our lives. Statistically speaking today, if you were born in abject poverty, you will remain there your entire life. In the United States, specifically, 60% of our population is living paycheck to paycheck. And as I'm sure you've noticed, food prices are high. Rent is high. I mean, a house is high, right? It, there's an increasing amount of people who are being left out of the ability to participate in society. We also talk about the statistics around wealth inequity. Inequity being the disparity between the wealthiest and the poorest, the US being one of the most unequal countries in the world. One of the challenges in high, highly inequitable societies is you have higher rates of uh, mental health, um, uh, negative mental health impacts. You have poor education rates for youth, higher rates of obesity, higher drug use. Okay, all of these things are directly correlated to wealth inequity across the study of a variety of countries. Now, when we talk about luxury and the idea of, of the billionaire and, and, and having that much capital, I wanna kind of put a billion dollars in perspective. So full disclosure, I'm not a billionaire. I don't know if any of you guys are, but for many of us, I think when we talk, when we hear about being a billionaire, for most people, when they think about that amount of money, right, this obscene amount of money, it really relates to two things. Security, I don't have to worry about paying my bills, my family will be fed, I have a roof over my house, right? These are important things, and then minor luxuries. So let's do the math on a 
billion dollars. Mm -hmm. If you spent a thousand dollars every hour mm -hmm. for 24 hours a day, you never slept, you just spent a thousand dollars every hour, it would take you 114 years to spend your first billion. Now, as we know, right, many billionaires don't own one billion dollars, they have typically multiple billions. So it has nothing to do with luxury. That's often the case, I think, many defenders of unfettered capitalism, the idea of like you, sh you should be able to accumulate as much as possible, they constrain it, they, they, con they kind of conflate it to a restriction of personal liberty. But the reality is you couldn't spend that much money in your lifetime even if you tried. You really genuinely could not spend a billion dollars. So it's much more than that. It's about the, the challenge with the billionaire God King is that you have these groups of people, again, who control these vital sectors of, of production, the means of production in various areas. In the United States, here's an example, I believe 70% of the companies worth over a billion dollars share at least one board member. So it's not just, you know, there's no, it's not, we can't put this in a vacuum. It's a large network of individuals who are leveraging this wealth to kind of dictate the direction of society in their, their kind of, to serve their personal needs. Now, at the heart of the crisis of the billionaire God King is the laws of property and contracts that we presently embrace. And in fact, we embrace them dogmatically. In the United States, all products, all goods, essentially kind of funnel down to the same core laws of property and contract, IP rights, copyrights, etc. Everything from a video game to a car to your insulin or your medicine you need is subject to that same type of law. And through decades of propaganda, through decades of legal corruption and bribery, we've really become very dogmatic about embracing a single form of market. But I want to share with you today, and we'll dive deeper into this in our, our discussion about systemic actualization, the history of the United, legal, the legal history of the United States um, does not in any way, shape, or form prevent multiple market orders from operating in tandem. So I want to emphasize and, and be super clear. The alternative I'm presenting is not the substitution of one ism for another. It's not about substituting capitalism for socialism, right? Um, that, that, I believe, is both uh, unfeasible but undesirable. Any restriction of a way of life is not the direction we want to go. So, so it's kind of this wholesale, you know, <coughs> a wholesale suite of, of laws that come with each ism um, it is not ideal. It's, it's about multiple market orders operating in tandem. And we'll talk about how that might take shape in later discussion. But ultimately, I, and, and I'll kind of conclude with this because as I shared in the beginning, Ultimately, our crisis is a crisis of spirituality. A, a large part of the challenge of the billionaire God King is that we have inherited systems of spirituality that are deeply hierarchical in their nature. I'm going to talk more about that in the crisis of dog, you know, doubt, desire, dog, and, uh, doubt, desire, death, and dogmas. But when you have hierarchical visions of spirituality, it paves the way for moral visions of hierarchy, right? It justifies moral hierarchy. So the billionaire god king today is not so different from the pharaoh's sun god of ancient Egypt. Beyond law, beyond need, and in many ways divinized through the collective mechanisms governing that society. Again, I want to emphasize, humanity will not be free. That, there's an immense amount of latent imagination trapped in these creations of our own making. Um, we've given our creations power over us, the economics, the laws that support these systems of class and caste, but I argue that they don't deserve that power. They can never be enough for us. So now we move to the crisis of information, truth, and trust. The crisis of information, truth, and trust is based on the idea that the highest form of cooperation in society today is transaction. So what I mean by that is the most frequent interaction you have with another person, most especially people you don't know, is to transact. The challenge with transaction as the highest form of cooperation is it perpetually puts us at risk. The very nature of transaction is I want to extract as much as possible while giving the least. 
So it always puts both parties at risk of being taken advantage of. Now that, as a fundamental grounding for society, diminishes our trust in others, it diminishes our trust in our institutions, it diminishes our trust in ourselves. One of the reasons I think you're seeing a large, a growing amount of unrest, especially let's say amongst the millennials and below, is that money is a core social group. It is not enough to keep people bound together around shared purpose and vision. <coughs> because ultimately, a consumer society is based on the fact that it preys on your desire and doubts. It's never enough. Now, a large challenge of information, truth, and trust is, again, going back to the single verticals of property and contract, we've placed the systems that we rely on for knowledge. We place the systems that we rely on for education, for connection, in this profit maximization model. So there's plenty of examples we can talk about. We can talk about uh, the popular um, news channels, right? Um, whether it be CNN, NBC, Fox, etc. These are for-profit propaganda machines that manufacture division so as to extract your attention and to generate additional wealth. Of course, as we know, right, the problem with this model is that once you push the, push the boundaries of sensationalism, you kind of have to keep going a little bit further each time. You gotta kind of keep getting more intense, more, more intense of what you're being shown. So you have these for-profit businesses that are effectively spouting a propaganda. And let me be clear, it's not, my challenge and my, my, my conflict is not that news serves a specific direction. We all have biases, we all serve a direction. I am serving a direction here in front of you today, right? I'm trying to point you in a specific orientation. It's not that they have a, a selection bias, it's that the incentive to maximize profit is embedded in that selection bias. So they're willing to do things that, without kind of concern for the large well-being, it comes down to the bottom line. What's this quarter's balance sheet going to look like? What's our advertising revenue going to look like? And what do we have to say and do to get people to kind of come back um, to our to our events, to our, our, our broadcasts. We can also talk about social media, right? Social media over the last 20 years. I was, so I was um, born in 1984, which means I was in college, in university, when social media came to be, Facebook. I remember when Facebook first came out, we were so excited. It was like this college only thing, it was really fun. But now we know the reality of the conflict, you know, what social media is after 20 years of being exposed to it. Social media is essentially algor algorithmic behavior modification, where over time, your preferences are redirected in a specific direction based on the feed that you see, which is typically intended to either incite anger in you or some sort of reaction. Uh, it's intended to manipulate your behavior to buy another widget in a certain direction. And the challenge, of course, is that many of the users are aware. So it's this kind of proactive, uh, it's, it's a dopamine hit, right? So it's addictive. It is, uh, it is essentially, again, it is manipulating us so that a, a mega conglomerate can kind of profit more and it's creating conflict by the design and nature of its feed. You may or may not be aware, but it's really interesting. When you think of a social media, you may have heard of TikTok. TikTok is a short kind of video-based social media. It's like two minute videos. And it's a, it's a Chinese origin organization. Now in China, TikTok and their youth, what they uh, dictate to their youth, and I'm not, uh, you know, honestly there's pros and cons, right? It's not a, you know, absolutely pro-China, but the idea being that China, their TikTok shows youth successes. This academic achievement of this student, this ath the student athlete just did this thing, this, um, you know, these are the highest like uh, published videos. That's what their algorithm promotes. In the United States, it promotes violence, it promotes virility, it promotes sex, you know, it promotes, and this is what our youth is, this is 14 year olds, this is what they're pro progressively promoting. So, we cannot stress enough that the, the platforms that we've kind of surrounded ourselves with, again, under a, a model of unfettered capitalism, just, it doesn't matter how they do it, just get the bottom line. These are proactively damaging our youth. We, we see immense rises, um, 
and quote a study in the book, there's immense rises in, in youth depression and anxiety, directly correlated to social media use. It's, it's actively bad for our, our society and, our, and our, our, our social bonds with each other. But again, we, we do it because the, the single, the, our dogmatic approach to market order and says, well, well, why not? Now, another thing that is funny, I, this book is 15 months old. So when I wrote this book, what I'm about to share next wasn't even a thing. But in the last six months, it's become a thing. You may be familiar with AI, right? And AI image and video generation. Uh, I've written several large language models. I've trained a few models, so I'm deeply intimately familiar with the technology. And I, I'm gonna make a prediction today. And I, I, you know, if I had any money, I'd make a large wager on it. But I would say that in, in within the next year, you will not be able to distinguish a video generated by AI versus a real human video. So we are blurring the lines between imagination and reality in a way that is going to have profound consequences. And that in itself, I want to again emphasize, that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. But under the, the kind of single market maximalism that we've confined it to, we know that it's going to be used for extractive and manipulative purposes because that's its greatest function. So I think when we think about the crisis of information, truth, and trust, we're kind of in this emergent place where the, the world is changing so rapidly and so fast, exponentially in, in you know, the infinite direction, that we're losing faith in our institutions, ourselves, and others, and, th and that presents a genuine crisis when it comes to how do we kind of collaborate to solve these problems when we can't even tell what is real and what is not. I hope you're gonna have question answers to all these questions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you, you're welcome to ask now, you can save to the end, I'll, I'll get through, but whatever, you wanna ask a question now? No, I just wanna know what the answers are. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. I'm saving those for about years, two, three, or four, so I hope you'll be there, right? <laughs> yeah. So let me go under here. Oh, and, and, you know, another, uh, let's see, we have oh, elective misrepresentation. Okay, perfect. So elective misrepresentation is the crisis that essentially, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'll kind of share a personal story about this. I shared it a bit in the, in the beginning, but uh, my journey to this point was, you know, I spent a lot of time doing local community organizing. I was doing a lot of um, like door knocking, canvassing for environmental issues, getting like you know, municipality aggregate energy purchasing, getting everyone to like get out of green energy as a, as a municipality. Uh, I've done a lot, I was instrumental in getting the $15 minimum wage passed in New Jersey in 2017. I was Governor Murphy's guest of honor in the state of state. Um, I have done a lot of um, like workers' rights uh, organizing activism. I then um, ran for political office, so I got a first-hand chance to see what that was like. I knocked on over 2,000 doors. I got crushed. I, I only got like 3,000 votes. Uh, if you're not familiar with New Jersey's political apparatus, it is unique in its corruption. They have a line where the parties <laughs> dictate who gets to be on the ballot. Um, and it's yeah, it's, it's, so ultimately, uh, what that experience taught me was that all of our available vehicles for change resisted by design. Even the movement organizations, like there's a lot of like nonprofit movement organizations, yeah. their political activism, they're co-opted. Because what you have to do is you have to compromise your vision in order to get a politico who is bound to have a kind of very specific framework of acting through the institutions themselves to, to kind of embrace this. So essentially, elected misrepresentation means that the world is essentially full of weak democracies and many of which exist under corporate capture. And this is most egregious here in the United States. Um, you may, may remember in 2010, they repealed um, the, the, the Citizens United, right? They, they changed the election finance rules. And what happened with the election finance is since, that, since 2010, so over the last 14 years, Dark money, which is money that is that you can't trace, it's not accountable, has grown exponentially. So it's doubled every every election cycle into our elections. So again, this kind of when we talk about the crises and, and why it's called the meta crisis, all these crises intertwine. The billionaire god king funnels ten million dollars to his favorite candidates who are going to repeal these regulations, so to speak. Right. So our democracy is essentially corporate capture. And we can talk about, before I get into you know, American political parties, I'll, I'll you know, 
ask a question, metaphorical, uh, we'll, we'll kind of get into it, but I would say, is the American democratic experiment working as intended, or has it failed? And the answer is, of course, both. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> well, in many ways, I think we can say that it's failed in many ways. We live in a society of rampant inequity. Again, more than half our population is living paycheck to paycheck. Food prices are out, you know, out, out of this world, fuel prices, et cetera. It's, it's becoming more expensive just to live, and more and more people are being left out of the opportunity to just kind of do that and participate. It has succeeded because we have to kind of go back to the U.S. Constitution, right? The U.S. Constitution, the legal document framing, and, and where all of our laws have essentially evolved from, was an inherently exclusive design. We have to remember that the US Constitution was designed so only white male property owners had a voice. I would not be able to vote. I don't own any property, right? Uh, forget, if you're a person of color, you, you were property, right? At the time of this legal document creation. So all of our legal innovations since then have just been minor evolutions. The US structure of representative democracy is designed to create impasse. It is designed to slow the pace of change because the founders of the country were a relative elite class in that moment. And their underlying philosophy was that the restriction of liberty for anyone is, is the most immoral and unjust thing. So we have to protect the elites because they knew, they, 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 they understood that if the general populace knew how concentrated the wealth was, knew how concentrated the levers of power were, they would revolt. They'd say, no, you have to distribute. You have to kind of you know, have a more collective economic model. The problem, of course, as we see with the billionaire God King, is that philosophy has morphed into this unfettered power dynamic, where it is no longer about liberty. It's no longer about luxury. It's no longer about the freedom to do whatever you want. Because at a certain level of capital, you're immune from wants. You can have anything you want at any time. It's about power maintenance. Now, let's talk about the, the design for impasse. So when we think about the United States Congress, you're probably familiar, there's a House of Representatives and there's a Senate, right? The Senate uh, was intended to represent the elites, the Congress, the commons. Now, if you're not a, a familiar with the way it works, so let's say, for example, uh, the House puts a bill forth and it passes, right? So if you know anything about modern politics, that's, that's a miracle in itself, given the infighting you know, at the moment. But in the immediate present, if it does pass the House, it then goes to the Senate for a vote. If the Senate refuses to look at that bill, it goes into the void. Nothing gets done. It doesn't even get looked at. And if any of you have ever been involved in politics or organizing, you know how much, it is an immense amount of work to get a bill, not just get a bill to the House, then get it voted on. I mean, that is an astronomical amount of manpower and will over hundreds of hours. Then to have the elites just say, no, we're not even gonna look at it. I'm not gonna vote on it. This is a system designed to preserve status quo. The challenge when we think about the poly crisis, the meta crisis, the age of crisis, is that the path of least resistance is exactly what's brought us to this moment. The path of least resistance is what has caused the crisis. So when you have institutions that resist change by design, that create impasse by design, that in combination with their, frankly, corporate capture, they represent only an elite class of interests. So it's, this is what turned me off from the kind of traditional methods of like, oh, I wanna run for office to kind of create change. You're not gonna create change within. The system will change you. You will become a part of what it is designed to do. So let's, let's move on from that. Let's go to, let me just see. And oh, that's what I want to talk about. The American political party. I want to be clear, this conversation is apolitical. I equally have disdain for both political parties. Now, historically, the Democrats and Republicans have, have kind of had two distinct kind of orientations, right? The Republicans are more market, less state. Less state interference, more markets, let markets solve the problem. The Democrats are more state regulations, less unfettered capitalism. Today, I would argue that that's no longer the case. It was this piston for some time, back and forth, back and forth. Today, the Republicans have an increasingly theocratic sect. 
a fundamentalist theocratic sect. I think that's an important note that is proactively attempting to just you know, strip the rights of women and minorities, people of color. The Democrats have no vision. They have no imagination. They have no structural project. They essentially exist to humanize the Republican efforts. The Republicans do this thing and there's outrage and the Democrats say, well, if you vote for us, we'll maybe make it less worse. <laughs> so there's no choice. And it's, it's, you know, it's, no, it's no surprise to me why, you know, one of the things I learned when I was door knocking, when I was canvassing, is how disengaged like the 30 and unders were with even voting. Just I'm not gonna do it, there's no point. And at the time, I was you know, really trying to encourage them to do it, but in retrospect, I can deeply empathize with their position. There is no alternatives available within the congressional power. There is no alternative vision in the United States. Again, it, everything that we're doing, whether through the crisis of extinction, information, truth, and trust, is furthering the very, the very issues that are giving us the, the various crises that we're surrounded by. Let's move on. Let's talk about the crisis of productivity and participation. So the crisis of productivity and participation is a misalignment of our traditional understandings of labor and participation in parallel with our evolving collective consciousness as a result of our technological ascendancy. That's very fancy, right? Essentially what it means is technology has connected the world intimately. It has kind of brought us together um, in such a way that the very nature of being human, the very nature of, of, of being an individual has kind of structurally changed, but the system surrounding us, we find there's an increasing number of people who are unable to participate in society, in the productive agenda of society. Now that matters. All of us can, I think, emphasize to some degree where we understand that participation is a huge source of meaning. It can be participation in your job. I know many of you mentioned you were lecturers before, right? And you, know, you got, probably got immense uh, meaning in, in, from teaching and engaging with students, whether it be a social club, a family, but whatever the case may be. Participation is a very vital source of how we define who we are in this world and what we stand for. The inability to participate is a ticking time bomb. And as more and more people kind of get left out, it's going to become, there's a real genuine precedence for violence for revolutionary action in a way that is beyond law and, and, and dialogue. Now, there's, there's kind of multiple ways we can, we can think about this. The first is that in the past, right, technological evolution is not a bad thing, and, and even I would argue losing jobs is not a bad thing. The problem is we lack the social infrastructure to allow people to redirect their lives. There is nothing for you if you're left out of the, you lose your job to lay off. So like, let's say, for example, we know that in the past, like let's say the past 20 years are a great example of, of technological uh, revolutions. Robotics has essentially laid off immense amounts of blue collar workers. The, many of the factories are automated now. If you, and there's, you, it's really impressive you know, how, how deeply integrated robotics are in many large warehouses. We are now on the wave in the next five to 10 years, I estimate, probably shorter, of the white collar workers being laid off en masse lawyers, accountants, data entry, AI is going to do all these jobs better than they ever could. There's no doubt about it, okay? It, can, it has much higher degrees of parallelism, it can do many more things at once, and the, the, the big struggle is in the past there were shortcuts, right? So think about the Industrial Revolution. That was like a major technological upset in the United States. You had the majority of the population that was doing sustenance farming. They were farming just enough to feed their families and that's how they lived. All of a sudden, you have industry, you know, coming, you have machines being imported, lathes, etc. It was very easy. There was a shortcut. You could take a farmer and say, go in this factory and pull this lever for eight hours. Don't move, pull the lever. And they wanted people who were essentially smart enough to pull the lever, but, <laughs> but not smart enough to, to ask how they got promoted, right? Like that was essentially what they desired. The challenge is the most advanced form of production today is what we, I would call the knowledge economy. Right? This is a, a, a type of work that, allow, that needs people to do a, a specific thing without having to conform to a specific way of doing it. So think about a software engineer. I need to build this product, I need to build this thing, but I can build it any way I want. I am writing that code, and 
I, my, my partner, my wife is also a, a developer. We can both write the same software and it'll be two different code packages, right? It'll be different, it'll do the same thing, but we might write it in different ways. The challenge with that type of work is that it's A, it's imaginative, B, it relies on dialectic, it relies on being able to communicate with the other and really kind of express ideas, and it requires a high degree of you know, the ability to kind of learn. Um, you know, a, 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 a recent conversation with some, some old colleagues, you know, there was layoffs at a company I was at, and they were kind of really struggling with their place in the world, and I tried to express to them that we don't get paid, as someone who works in the knowledge economy, this is how I genuinely feel, I don't get paid for what I know, I don't get paid for the hours I work, I don't get paid for anything. I get paid because my capacity to learn, and then implement those learnings in a specific direction. That is what knowledge economy work is. How quickly can you orient yourself to the problem and then solve that problem? The challenge is there's no shortcut. You cannot take a factory worker, put them in front of a computer and say, write me some software. Right? You can network my infrastructure. You can't do that. It takes decades of, of training and learning. And, and AI is making that, it's shortening that gap. But even knowing how to use AI is a skill that is, is not easily taught. So, we lack the shortcuts that we've historically lacked, so it's not the same this time. And I think that's, that's really, really important when we think about you know, the, the crisis of productivity and participation. Let's see what's next. Let's go to, oh, there's one other thing. I, there's a, a great, um, there's a, you may or may not be uh, familiar with the term web three. Web3 refers to a, a community of, of people developing on what we call blockchains. Blockchains are a, a software technology, they're a ledger. Think about an accounting book. Okay, but what a blockchain does is it automatically records any, any interaction between two people. So if you're transferring money, if you're committing to do work, you can like commit to do work and then the pay, you can put money in escrow and, the, and a smart contract will then pay you. And in that, in that space, there's a big fan, there's a big, um, there's an article by an individual named Scott Alexander called Meditations on Moloch. Moloch, if... Meditations on what? Meditations, um, like meditating. Meditations on Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H. Moloch is the god of discord from the ancient days. Okay. Sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. And the challenge that Scott writes, but he writes about, it's a long article, but what I find most fascinating about it is that he talked about how systemic incentives lead to outcomes that nobody wants. So let me give you an example of that. The capitalist systemic incentive. Produce, right? It's, it, capitalism is great at many things. Innovation, production, imagination. It's also great at polluting the rivers. It's also great at dumping waste where it can put it. Right? It's, it's not, it, it, it lacks the responsibility. The problem is that we've organize ourselves around the idea of the individual rationalist who acts out of their own self-interest. Now, A, I disagree that, that the majority of individuals only care about their self-interest. I don't think that's accurate, but that's how we've organized society. And because of that, because we've organized our law, our economics, and our politics around that, that visualization of who the individual is, we've produced a society of incentives that are perverse, that harm us in many ways so that you know, it harms the collective so that you know, a few may benefit immensely. And that, I think, is part of the, the crisis of, of productivity and participation. Many in the Web3 space could argue that coordinations are our biggest challenge of, of the crises. I would disagree. I'd say that the frameworks of meaning and value we embody are, are kind of define our coordination. You know, what they mention about systems, but I do want to talk about, I, I believe that all systems bear the moment of the imprint of their creation in two distinct ways. So the moment they're created, they have two imprints. The first is what they were supposed to do, right? They were supposed to do a certain thing, so that's one of their imprints. Of course, the moment they began being used, they begin to deviate because people use them for things that they weren't intended to be used for. The other, the second imprint is the values embodied by their creator, which inform the how, which inform how that system governs relationships between people. And in many ways, again, We've inherited systems that have a deeply hierarchical vision of divinity, of spirituality, of humanity that kind of is perverse. So 
We're going to get into our, our last uh, crisis of uh, the, the day, Doubt, Desire, Death, and Dogmas, so and we'll open up for some, some discussion. Doubt, Desire, Death, and Dogmas. Is at its heart a crisis of spirituality. It represents the, the need. We have to develop new answers to old questions to overcome the various crises we're surrounded by. Because everything about our current trajectory only leads us further towards oblivion. And it it's really kind of highlights a paradox of the age of crisis, of the meta-crisis. The idea of systemic actualization, which I'm going to dive deeper into in the, in the upcoming lectures, is the idea of kind of how do we organize society to kind of maximize individual access and agency. It requires a certain amount. It, it, Systemic actualization is done so that we prioritize individual actualization. We elevate the individual. We maximize their capacity to act within the moment. But it requires a certain amount of individually actualized people to, to realize. So there's kind of nowhere to begin with but the end, which is why I argue that the spiritual alternative is, is central to kind of overcoming these problems. Now, doubt. So this is a matrix I made. You don't just have to read it. I'm just throwing it up there. This is essentially doubt, desire, and death, I would make the argument, is what all religions historically try to solve. These are the three questions. It's, it's the unknowable unknowns of these three questions of how we kind of grapple with these in our daily experience. Now, each of these, this is kind of an analysis. Again, you can look at it. You know, I'm not going to talk too deeply about each of them. But doubt is groundlessness. The idea that through a lifetime of conditioning, what we do is never enough. We never feel at home in our place in the world. Now, I want to emphasize from the start, all three of these are innately part of being a human. And I am not making the argument that transcending them is feasible or even desirable. The challenge is that doubt, I can send this to you guys, you don't have to take it, I'll, I'll make sure I'll email for the end of the, uh, the day. Thank you. Doubt is, the, the struggle with doubt is that it's perpetuated by the institutions we are surrounded by. Right, you guys have probably heard of um, the phrase, keep me up with the, the Joneses, right? My neighbor has this new car, I feel like I'm not as special as him, I don't have this new car, I need to buy this new car. So everything about this kind of consumer society encourages doubt in our actions. It, it drains meaning from our activities. Because we're perpetually concerned about, are we enough? And is it enough? Am I, am I, is what I'm doing enough? And that's a major struggle. I would say that doubt is a catalyst for cowardice. When we inhabit state, high states of doubt, we retreat inward. We imagine a kingdom of things we should do but are afraid to because of the potential failure. And so we don't act. Doubt paralyzes us. And many of the, I would argue it, it, through this, this map, that many of the existing religious institutions fail to address doubt given our context today. And I want to emphasize this because I know it sounds critical. My argument has nothing to do with believers of the faith. It has nothing to do with whether religion is good or bad. Obviously, the answer is both. All of these religions listed have done horrible things and they've done amazing things. There's no doubt about that. The question is, do they meet the needs of the moment? The salvation religions refer to the idea that you ascend to heaven when you die. Salvation is found. Divinity is found post-death. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Buddhism, we can also kind of lump Hinduism in that, that category, although there are distinct differences. Um, and Confucianism, Confucianism being the ancient Chinese religion of kind of overcoming the world through service to the other. So all three of these kind of address them in, in, in distinctly specific ways. Desire, insatiability, right? What we have is never enough. We want more through, you know, we've always wanted more, whether it be ancient humanity seeing the honeycomb on the tree and saying, oh, I'm gonna climb up and I don't care if I get stung by bees, I want that honey, to modern day, you and I go get a shiny object and we're really excited about that shiny object and two weeks later, it's kind of dull and I see that shiny object and I want that one. We always want more. It's part of being human. And 
the, the challenge is, is that plagues are, are, are kind of very nature of choice. Now, you may have heard one of the popular, you know, Buddhism has the Four Noble Truths, and one of the Four Noble Truths is desire being the root of suffering. Right? The idea is to kind of eliminate desire to kind of eliminate your suffering. I make the argument that, that again, you're not going to eliminate desire, but what we can do is we can, through the cultivation of individual practice and orientation of beliefs, reduce our projection of expectations onto the moment. I'm gonna talk about, in our next discussion, we're gonna dive deep into the cosmology of physics, kind of grounding our alternative spirituality. But in many ways, I'll, I'll begin that we kind of inherit this moment. Here we are, all five of us here in this room, and the past is inaccessible, future is unknown, and we kind of have to act with the information we have in the immediate present. And so where we become most frustrated with desire is we end up, we, we want the moment to be this thing, we want to make it this object, it's not this object, and that frustrates me. Therefore, I focus my energy and attention to the frustration, and it, it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Right? So how do we kind of overcome that? And finally, death. Death strikes at the heart of the religious project, the spiritual project. And in many ways, death is that, that question. How do we know the unknowable unknown, right? And we have, I think, all of us kind of, in, through our evolution, through where we, we kind of inherit, we have this innate biological fear of death for some context, right? I think it, for many, many years of human evolution, we were afraid of like a jaguar biting our neck when I was walking through the jungle, and it was gonna be a very painful death, right? So there's that association of pain and death. Another big fear of death is consciousness in the void. What happens if I die and there's nothing? And I'm aware, but there's, I don't have senses, right? That fear of oblivion. That is a, an immense fear. And each of the, the, the narratives have kind of constructed their own answer to death, some more compelling than others. I'm going to pick on the salvation narratives for a bit because they are the, the religious institutions that have had the most outsized systemic influence on global society. That is to say that the systems governing global society today were crafted by people who deeply embodied a salvation vision of divinity. The idea that we only know divinity after death. I will make the argument today that the very nature or the very notion of ascending to heaven is a hierarchical vision of spirituality. It is a hierarchical vision of divinity that innately makes in-groups and out-groups. So long as we embody hierarchical visions of spirituality, we will have mortal hierarchies pervading our structures because it is just and moral. When we think about the origins of the salvation narratives, these were tribal religions, and essentially a large part of their philosophy, their, their spiritual philosophy, was the justification of the conversion or coercion of the other, right? Religion throughout history. And this is not just the salvation narratives. Buddhism is the same. I'm not sure about Confucianism, but I don't think so. Um, but you know, religion has used, been used as a mandate for war for, for many times, right? The idea that either you're part of our tribe or you're not. And again, it met the needs of a moment of a, of a bronze and iron age humanity. It met those needs. There was a tremendous amount of unknowns. Today, in a collectively networked society, the, out, the idea of basing spirituality about an in-group versus an out-group, but a hierarchical, hierarchical orientation, it, it posits divinity beyond death. And I argue that it's not the case. Divinity is, is accessible now. And our cosmology and physics reinforce that. And we'll, we'll dive more into that next week. So on that note, I think that can, we can kind of wrap up our, our analysis of the crisis. I know this has been a, a, you know, a downer class, but I assure you the next three will be much more optimistic about where we're, we're going. But yeah, let's open up to discussion. Questions? Uh, I have more than a question. I feel like you define the notion of crisis as something that's current, as opposed to being an ongoing thing that's been going on for an enormously long period of time. Mm. And that issues of uh, capitalism and, and the, 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 appro the appropriate involvement of corporations is, a, is in my mind, a, a recent phenomenon. Mm. The, 
if you look at, at the last 40 years, we've gone through a process of quadrupling the size of the middle class of the world 10 or 15 times, just yeah. from the impacts of social changes in China and India alone. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the United States, we've had a long period of equalizing or making the income distribution more fair until very recently, uh, starting with the uh, changes in the uh, laws affecting capital gains, we reversed that trend. Mm -hmm. So up until, the, until uh, Reagan became president, we were doing a wonderful job of expanding the, the uh, equality of, of income across the population. But when we decided to treat capital gains more, more favorably in income tax terms, we all of a sudden move money from the vast majority of the population to what you call this kingdom of billionaires. And it's purely associated with how we treated capital gains. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, generally speaking, the crisis has been an ongoing phenomenon. We, if you think about what uh, Europe was like uh, since Rome through the Reformation, it was a continuous battle of using uh, access to heaven as a way of controlling the population. We Reformation got rid of that, and we've had a, a change in the way we view religious impact on whether or not uh, we view death as uh, an entry into some kingdom. And uh, we have a lot of people who don't really give a damn what's going to happen after we die. So I'm not sure that the basis of crisis uh, is as awful as it sounds. It's been going on forever. I, the, the example, the newspapers uh, leading up through the turn of the 19th century were terrible. Yeah. They were much worse than Facebook ever has been yeah. in terms of, uh, Pulitzer was a, a terrible person in terms of what he published in his newspapers. So I just don't feel like that is the basis of a crisis. Although people do feel like they're in a crisis, but we're looking at a very narrow picture of the world. Well, I, I would make two points. I agree with everything you said in terms of it being, you know, we've inherited this moment. It, it isn't something that's just occurred recently. It's been a long time kind of in this trajectory. Reagan was 40 years ago, so it's some time, right? And, and, but at the same time, I would make the counter argument, we can only ever evaluate it from the immediate present. Here we are. And the present trajectory in terms of the trends of, let's say, for example, the environmental collapse, um, the disparity of incomes and equity. You mentioned global poverty reduction without a doubt, but as you mentioned, most of global poverty reduction has come from China and India, which is very much went through the same thing the US went through, that farmer to in industry right. transformation. So there's no doubt that there has been progress. The challenge is the, the scale of the crises we've now faced, let's say compared to in the past, let, you know, in, in the crisis of extinction being the most kind of in our face one. If, if where we can grow food and our access to clean water, drinking water changes, that is going to cre create massive social unrest. The crisis of information, truth, and trust, I think I hear you what you're saying about newspapers, and I agree. You know, I have a, there's a, a quote in the book, I think from like 1917, complaining about the, the newspapers and, and how they're propaganda. But at the end of the day, the scale that they impact people today is far beyond anything they, they ever have been. So the that, that our crisis is an ongoing process, yes, I agree. And in, I, I mentioned earlier, it is the path, we've, it's the trajectory we've been on. It is the path of least resistance. The challenge is we can only go so, so much further before you start having genuine systemic collapse. You know, there's, if you, when we, I, I shudder to think of a world, say the United States, where and this is already happening, right? There's communities in the United States who don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, I sure to, to think when that crosses a certain threshold where people start to get violent. Uh, because th that is ultimately like the dissolution of the institutions when they can no longer sustain themselves. So I, I guess if, if we're not going to evaluate it from now, my only counter question would be, what would be the alternative? Yes, it's been happening. Yes, we know it's bad. But how else do we evaluate it from, from where we are in the immediate present? 
Well, I think that there is one crisis that we do need to handle. Yeah. So that is what we're going to do about the change of plan. Sure. If we continue to ignore our pollution of the atmosphere, it'll take care of itself. But it'll, it in the future may change who we are. For sure. Eliminate us and let some new life form come back in. But um, it's a crisis to us, but not to the universe. Well, I would say that those are the same thing. And we'll guide deeper into that into the next kind of the next discussion about the orientation of spirituality that cosmology and physics provides us. Um, but I, I think we are very much a part of this universe, so I think it, it, it does matter. Um, it's very much you. Know, uh, I'll give you one kind of hint, right? So there's a mathematician, uh, Stephen Wolfram, talks openly about you. Know, the the laws governing the universe are the way they are because we are the way we are. It's not the opposite, which is the kind of materialist rationalist thinking that we've kind of come up to, um, but recent innovations of the last decade are, are completely reframing our hard sciences. Um, so I hear you, I hear what you're saying, and I, and, and I appreciate that feedback, um, but you know, my, my only kind of counterpoint is if we're going to act, if we're going to kind of change our trajectory, it has to happen now. There's no alternative. It can't happen in the past. We don't know if it'll happen in the future. It only matters how we direct our action you know, in the immediate present. That's true. Appreciate it though. Any other kind of discussion points, threads? How, how do you define spirituality? That's a great question. Yeah. I define spirituality as how at home are you in the immediate present? How at home are you with this totality of experience? And I'm going to bleed a little bit into my next. So, like, again, the discussion number two is like the core under the philosophy of, of the spiritual alternative. But I would make the argument that. The what our hard sciences are now telling us is we have an intimate relationship with the universe, and it's very much in relation to our being observers. The observer and the totality of the circumstance being a kind of single totality of the moment. So for me, spirituality is how deeply at home are you in the immediate present? In, in the next discussion, I'll, I'll introduce the observable infinities, and which are the universe and human imagination, and I'll kind of ground those in some science. And the alignment of those two represents divinity in the moment. So the question is, how do we maximize every individual's capacity to align those two things, to create, to become more godlike in the moment? Uh, so spirituality for me, and the kind of alternative I'm presenting is, how deeply are you at home in this immediate present? Because that's all it ever is. We inherit the now. You've raised more questions than you answered. I mentioned. know, it's so fun, isn't it? <laughs> well, I hope you we'll I hope you all see you next week because I the next week will be I, I promise you a really fascinating discussion. I, I, we'll talk about a lot of concepts. That I think um, you know the crisis. You know, I think many of you guys probably came in here with some inkling of you know, what these ideas were, and it wasn't necessarily a surprise when I said, "Oh, the environment is collapsing." Um, I think next week will be a lot of information that will be really um, unique. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. me too. You're going to send out your PowerPoint? Yeah, absolutely. I'll I, I want to look at that. that the, uh, the Matrix? That yeah. piece that yeah. you had on, on, on the religions closer. Yeah, and I would appreciate feedback. You know, one thing, you know, in, in our third discussion about individual actualization, I write about being an authentic imposter. Uh, and I want to emphasize to you that in the introduction of the book, I note this spiritual alternative isn't complete. Um, so one thing I, I kind of haven't mentioned to you guys, but um, since I released the book, a community is formed around it, and we're in the process of incorporating a nonprofit, a 501c3. So um, it, we're actually it's a it's a decentralized community, and what we're doing is um, the community now governs and stewards the book, so they own it. All the profits that I've ever made from the book go to the community, and actually I'm really proud of this. After 15 months, the community's come together, and they're actually uh, publishing a, like a, a changed edition to one of the chapters. They they rewrote the chapter collectively. Which I'm really excited about. The idea being that spirituality must evolve alongside its community of practitioners. And I, I think many of the inherited religions, the challenge with them and why they don't meet the needs of the moment is that they're static in their orientation of beliefs. And what they attempt to do is they attempt to perpetually project the past onto the present. They attempt to reinforce past values and beliefs into our immediate present. Um, and that's what the structure is. And ultimately, with any of these religions, 
and I, I say this, and it's not meant to be offensive, but I, you can only embrace these with a selective hypocrisy. You choose these texts, and you say, I believe these texts, I believe these passages, but I don't believe these. And the challenge is, let's say specifically with the salvation matters, uh, okay, we can, there's, you know, we have a crisis in our immediate present that has deeply spiritual you know, nature in it. The challenge with the salvation narratives is because they were designed for, again, uh, for Judaism, Bronze Age, and Christianity, Islam, Iron Age populations, and because they were used as kind of a, a mandate for war, those aspects of the spirituality exist. And so long as they exist within those central texts, fundamentalists will leverage them. So you cannot decouple spiritual warfare from these visions of spirituality so long as you embrace those texts, because it's part of it. It's part of the very foundation of that spiritual project. And that's why I believe there's an alternative is necessary. Because so long as we have forms of spirituality that allow us to discriminate against others, to oppress others, because they are not God's chosen, they are not us, they are not part of our group, spiritual warfare will always be a justification. And they may guise it in various ways, but it's, it's a challenge. So I think you know, if we're truly being whole with ourselves, you know, it's, I find it a, a challenge. And I was raised, you know, so some ba I was raised a Roman Catholic. I went through the whole process, got confirmed, right? Like I, I read the Bible. Yeah, I am, you know, these are things that I've, and obviously I've done a ton of uh, research for the, the book. Um, but I've, I've really struggled with that. I, I don't think there's a way to, to really embrace them with your whole self without, a, again, a selective hypocrisy. And the problem is there's no consensus on that hypocrisy. So different people pick and choose different things they want to believe. Um, so. Well, the, the question I'm dealing with now is our present crisis mm -hmm. includes more efforts of uh, <clears throat> people to actually kill those who change. In other words, if, if you say the wrong thing, then somebody's likely to kill you mm. physically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you how do you look how do you look at change when you say well somebody's out there going to murder? Yeah. So that's a great question. To be candid, I haven't given it too much thought, but here's my kind of off the cuff thing. But obviously, the powers that be, if if they are going to eliminate someone, they have to be very careful. You don't want to make a martyr, right? And you can't kill an idea. So the idea, you know, essentially, you have to speak boldly about change. I mean, this is in my humble opinion. Now, I, uh, one story I haven't shared with you guys, but I think it's relevant, especially to my conceptualizations of death. Um, I, when I was 22, uh, so right out of college, I contracted bacterial meningitis, which if you're not familiar, is an infection of the spine. It puts pressure on your brain. I literally was out with my buddies one night. The next night, I was in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for four months. It then took about six months to recover. The doctor told my mother and father that they should plan a funeral. And um, somehow, miraculously, made like a full recovery. Um, I happened to be, I was fortunate. I was wrestling at the time. I was a college wrestler, so it was, I was in the best year of my life. Maybe that helped kind of recover. Um, but when I woke up, I couldn't, couldn't speak. I was mentally OK, but I couldn't verbalize. Um, so they thought I would have disabilities. So I say that in the fact that it's like, at least in my own personal perspective, I'm kind of on borrowed time. So it's like, you might as well use it to the maximization to kind of create your vision of the ideal. Because what's the point? Right? And this is in many ways, this is a lot of like ancient philosophy, ancient religion talks about you know, the idea of like reincarnation is like almost a trap. You get reincarnated and you kind of live the same life. And you live this life where you prioritize security mm -hmm. instead of creating your vision of the ideal. And that is a trap. Um, so for me, that's, that's kind of my personal perspective. I wouldn't project that on anyone else. You know, I have a, a partner, I have a young child, so obviously there are some things I can't do, right? There are some things I can't be so flippant about. Um, I have responsibilities, but at the same time, um, I strongly believe that like, if you're not speaking truth to power, so to speak, what's the point? Why, you know, for me, it's not, it's not enough for me personally to sit and play video games all day. That's not how I choose to spend my time, right? As I know, Many of you, from your accomplishments I've heard earlier, you've probably chosen a similar path. Yeah. Did you have a, a question? Well, I had a comment yeah. that the one thing that worries me the most is the violence that is forming in our society now. Yeah. The violence, as, as Glenda said, you know, people 
just kill people if they, if they don't like what they say. Yeah. And it just bothers me. In the future, um, I have children, grandchildren, you know. And Are I'm, you talking locally or globally? Globally, no, not, not here. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. In everywhere. other words, if, if you wanted to change something in Congress now, there, there might be somebody that would murder you. Mm -hmm. Right. It's happened. They, they're threatening judges. But yet, the actual murder rate is declining. Yeah, but there's threats all the time. Oh, there's been threats forever. Of course. Oh. So are we afraid of the threat, or are we afraid of the consequence? Yes, yes, to both. Guns. <laughs> the guns are not under control. Here's one thing I'll add to this conversation that I think is really important kind of goes alongside the crisis of the billionaire God King and the crisis of elective misrepresentation. The U.S. is the leading manufacturer of weapons of mm -hmm. war. That is a for-profit enterprise. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you tie profit to war weapon manufacturing, there will be war. There will be yes. perpetual war. Okay? It's no secret that the wars that have been going on are not intended to end. Iraq, Afghanistan, these were never intended to end. There was no point. They were there to sell missiles for 20 years. Yeah. Let us be candid about the nature of our circumstance. Yeah. Again, when we embody dogmas about single market maximalism, weapons, if they, I mean, I'm of the belief, and I write this in the book, there's no putting, the Pandora's box is open. We're not getting rid of weapons. That's a silly idea, right? Um, but you could socialize weapons manufacturing. You could say that specific industry doesn't, should not be equated as a private industry. And then, yeah, and then you could say there must be a vote if they're going to be a certain many, et cetera. Right? There's, there's, there is alternatives, but we don't have the willpower in our elected officials because how many millions, if not hundreds of millions, I don't even mean possibly billions, does the weapons manufacturers invest in our elections every year? And it's not just federal elections, state officials as well. Right? So I, I think there's, you, the, corrupt, the, the rod is deep, right? But it's, again, when you have a society that at its core, through its frameworks of meaning and value, embodies anotherness, that another individual could be less than, it's not surprising that this is the outcome. I like it. Yeah, me neither. I disagree. <laughs> you disagree with weapons? What you just said. Okay. Well, if you just go back to the king of Spain and the discovery of the new world, he, he spent, she spent, all of the money that they took out of, out of the new world for weapons. I mean, the hist history since Columbus has been which the, uh, the kings and queens of various countries have done the same thing. It's no different. No, but I disagree with that last statement. There's an immense difference in the scale of weaponry, the advanced, the, the advanced, I, I mean, absolutely. I think that the scale of weaponry has gone down. The only thing that's gone up is population. No, the no. destruction of capacity of our weapons have absolutely gone up. I mean, there's no because doubt. Because there's more people to kill than we had back in uh, 1492. <laughs> but, but I'm just trying to understand like the root of your argument. Like, if so, I don't think you can. I don't think of the con contrast of you know, cannons and swords and. I don't know if but I had muscles the, at that time. The, 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 the producer of those cannons and swords were the same profit-oriented people that are the suppliers of American. No, but I mean, that we know is not true, right? These, these are mega conglomerates. These are like highly networked conglomerates in bed with the financial institutions. There's about five of them. Yeah, and they're, they, it, that's just it. It's like a monopolization that influences many verticals of society. So well, it's but, not. That's no different than what took place in terms of the, uh, the royalties of England in terms of them building ships and becoming the most powerful navy in the world up until we were. I, I mean, I, we can agree to disagree. I think there's a fundamental difference in like advanced drone warfare, um, AI targeted like network swarm drones, which is being developed in the immediate present. You, what you're, you, the problem is, you're talking about warfare as if it's this linear thing, but warfare is scaling exponentially. So it's not linear. And like the, the t you cannot, the application of like philosophy, like Spain and England, Spain's the size of like Texas. Like it's not, it's not, you know, it's not. A, you Spain, know, it's, Spain yeah. controlled 
all of I the South what American mean. part of <clears throat> North America. You're missing the context of the history, though. I mean, yes. in those days, Spain was one of the most powerful nations in the world. We won't always be the most powerful nation in the world. Anyway, I firmly believe that. I firmly believe we're on a down yes. scale China's at this the, point. China's on the rise, and we're on the down. Yeah, I but, mean, I think, I think you have to take context in, 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 into play in this whole thing, because for that time period, the type of, of weaponry <laughs> they had, they felt was massive weaponry that was going to destroy their enemies, just as we have it. Now, I, I can't disagree that a, a nuclear bomb can probably destroy more than a, a cannonball off of a, a ship, but you have to take the context, uh, look at the context. So the help time. me understand, because what I'm confused by both of the arguments about context is how does that relate to the profitization of war and the incentives that gives. It was profitization of the war back in 1492. But, Same thing. But what is the correlate? Like, what is the correlation? So, are you saying that because it existed in the past, it's fine today? I'm not sure. Like, what's the argument against There's what I'm saying? The difference between the decision to award a certain cannon manufacturer contracts to build the cannons for the ships of Spain was the same <laughs> profit maximization that is warning Northrop to get whatever they build in the United States. I hear you, but my argument is that the profitization motive, the idea of having weapons being a profit center. But is, it's been a profit center. But this is my point. Just, yeah, the past, that's just it. We, we don't want to project the past. Because it was good in the past doesn't mean it should be ideal in the present. I'm not clear on that connection. No, but it's saying it's the ideal. But it, that, I think what we're saying is that it, today probably isn't more out of whack than it was historically. I mean, it, because you have to take it into account world population and where we are technologically. But you also have to take into account cultural ascendancy, right? Spain believed that the natives and the Africans should be slaves. Spain so believed- Spain, Spain believed that they could convert those of course, to of course, hierarchical visions of spirituality right. to right. convert or that coerce the, the other. basis of their, their drive to do what they did. I agree, but my point is that is unacceptable. That is not the ideal it's that we should go for. It's to you. But is it acceptable to you? Not particularly, but it's not in itself the base. What I'm trying to say, the crisis you describe now is the crisis that existed in 1492. No, it's different. They've learned so much more. Yeah. They know, know so that. much yeah. more. Is it worse? <laughs> I think it's worse. Yeah, but the, the worst part is the fact that there's now 8 billion people. Back in 1492, there wasn't quite a billion. Yeah, but I don't think that, that, that the myth of like overpopulation, the entire population of the United States could fit in the world, could fit in a few cities. Like, there's so much land on the earth. It's not about. Like that's like a, a depopulation myth. I think that's a very slippery slope when we get into like overpopulation because ultimately who suffers? The well, poor? No, no, population actually is headed down. It'll yeah, peak, birth rates are down all over. It'll peak somewhere around 10 billion, then fall back down to below 5 million within 100 years. As what happens is that birth rates are declining incredibly fast. Yeah, why and even in is? countries that have high birth rates now, they're going down. I, I, okay. oh, well, I mean, I'm still not clear. Um, I understand it's been that way. I understand the context you're presenting. I understand that you're saying the U.S. is a, a you know, we can equate it to the Spanish Empire. What I don't understand is like where the disagreement comes from that it's not ideal and we shouldn't do it because just because it's been done in the past is not a reason to do it in the immediate present, especially given the the kind of cultural. Evolution and my challenge is that you're associated with a notion of profit and a certain stru structure of economic activity yeah. that has always existed. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean it was not a problem, though. That's my, my statement. If it's always existed, it could have been a problem back then, too. Well, who should say it's a problem? <laughs> well, I think when you have when you <laughs> profitize war manufacturing, <laughs> the, the, the idea is to sell more weapons. The only way you sell more missiles is by shooting missiles. Well, then. Why does that not apply to production of food? 
Well, I think profit maximization is, is used to produce food. Well, I want to be clear. I also disagree with food being a, pro a private vertical outside of uh, you. Well, I agree with basic food stuff being a, well, a non private let's, well, let's take away, if you challenge that, then why, why is uh, we allow Disneyland to exist as a profit maximizer? Because well, this is the center argument I've kind of briefly kind of touched upon is that today you have a single market maximalist approach. All of the things you're mentioning inhabit a single vertical of property and contract. But in the United States and actually in the, all of the developed world, it's only about half of it is associated with a, a, a profit maximizing thing. The United States is probably one of the largest socialized countries in the world. We have huge amounts of government owned activity. The biggest power company in the world is the TVA. It is owned by the government. So I'm, 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 I challenge your assumption that somehow profit <laughs> maximization or the structure this. is associated with profit maximization. It's just not a true thing. I, I think, no, with all due respect, I think it's blatantly false that the United States is the most socialized country in the world. China obviously has a much greater social infrastructure, social support programs, all of these things, I mean, that's, that's evident. Oh, China has terrible social support organizations. <laughs> okay, we took that like pause, because I mean, I, I don't wanna like get too deep into it, but but that's not an accurate statement. The Chinese people aren't, aren't living paycheck to paycheck, right? 60% of their population isn't on poverty level. 60% of their population doesn't like struggle with like food insecurity, okay? That's where we are in our immediate present today in the United States. So I find it very difficult to take the argument that we're the most socialized country in the world well, I challenge your argument that 60% of the United States is dealing with food problems. It's not true. Okay, I will bring in our next discussion. I will bring the, the journals to prove what I'm saying to you. It's in the book as well. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll happily give you that data, and then you can analyze it yourself, and if you want to conduct an alternative study. <laughs> I've anyway. got a question about irony here. If Oops. you deeply believe that abortion is murdering something, sure. And you therefore, to cure the problem, murder the the, the doctors who who commit abortions. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's that's endless. That's been going for, for ever since the beginning of time. Sure. That kind of thing. Yeah, that's again. I, I would attribute that to the selective hypocrisy, right? It's justified to murder this person because they are, despite murder being against my central tenets, mm -hmm. I can justify it. By, by murdering somebody. By murdering, right? Because yeah. I'm preventing a murder. So that hasn't changed over the no. centuries. And yeah, I mean, we've been able to sell indulgences forever. <laughs> but I'm not, is, I, any I, of, is any of that, that going to change? I'm not, yeah, but I'm not sure like why. Like I'm not arguing against the selling of indulgences. I'm not arguing against any of that stuff. What I'm arguing is that when we lump everything into a single form of property and contract, a single form of market, Right, we're we're pro but we don't do that. We do do that in the United States. <laughs> There's a single. <laughs> I mean that that's absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I'm being very genuine with you. Like that is the nature of the United States. There's basic laws of property and contract that all of our public goods fall into. Right, the same laws of copyright, copyright or or trademarks or or patents. Right, patent a video game, patent your insulin. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I mean. So we do do that. You understand? Like what I'm saying is that there could be alternative market orders operating in tandem. So like your insulin might be under a different structure of property and contract so that we might not maximize profit on necessary medicine, hypothetically. So you, the, the argument is not for, again, I'm not saying we have to get rid of one thing. I want to emphasize this because I appreciate all the feedback, but I want to be super clear. My argument is not the substitution of one suite of, of your verticals and just get rid of them and put another, it's that we can have them operating in tandem. The legal history of the United States says we can do that. There's no restrictions on market order. But when you have everything in a for-profit structure that exists today, it, it gives perverse incentives. Next week. Next week. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I do Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question is, can any of this change? <laughs> well, if we don't, we're soon going to find out what it's going to be like. Well, in terms well of we climate. won't know because we'll be dead. <laughs> we won't be dead. I'm not sure we'll be dead. Well, we, we, will, we will be dead for sure. We will for sure. <laughs> well, what's an interesting debate.
It is certainly is. <laughs> okay. Yes. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you.